Good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Webinar Wednesdays. AGRA has hosted this program since January 2019. My name is Jerry DiMaggio. I'll be serving as the moderator for today's webinar, which is entitled Effective Moving Dynamic Loads on Pavement Deflections and Balcat Calculated Modulus. This is a part one of a two-part series. We'll be speaking more about part two uh, at the conclusion of the program. Next slide, please. Just a few housekeeping items in the uh, introductory slides. First of all, if you're experiencing an issue with related, uh, related to sound and you're using your computer speakers, we'd suggest that you dial in using a phone. If you have another issue with the webinar, then please click on your chat button at the top and send a note only to the host and we'll do our very best to try to assist you. Next slide, please. If you have questions, uh, please click on the Q&A button and send your question both to the host and to the panelists. We'll be addressing uh, all of the questions that we receive during the Q&A period at the conclusion of today's technical program. And like most of our speakers, Dr. Lee will be sharing his email address and generally will entertain questions subsequent to the program for generally about a two-day period. Please make them consulting questions. That's pretty much all we ask. Next slide, please. So you see the presentation in full screen mode at the top of your webinar settings. Click on the down arrow, highlight view, and then choose to fit the viewer. Next slide, please. Now I'd like to give you a brief introduction to our presenter, Dr. Lee. Uh, holds both a master's in civil engineering and his PhD from Michigan State. He has approximately 15 years experience. He's currently a senior research engineer with ARA's um, Illinois office in Champaign-Urbana. And he has conducted uh, research exclusively in the pavement area, but in a variety of topics, truck pavement interaction, dynamic modeling of asphalt pavements, pavement surface characteristics, as well as viscoelastic asphalt material characterization. And now please welcome our presenter, Dr. Lee. Thank you, Jerry. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and maybe even good evening, depending on where you are. And thanks for uh, joining us today. Uh, just as a quick reminder, the title of uh, today's webinar is Effective Moving Dynamic Loads on Payment Response and Performance. But this is part one of a two-part webinar series. So today we will focus on payment response and save our uh, discussion for, on payment performance for part two of the webinar uh, to be held next month. Uh, with that said, um, <clears throat> here are the two learning objectives for today. Um, the first objective is to understand the difference between fixed point and moving frame analysis methodologies for payment deflection and response simulation. And the second objective is to understand the effect of moving dynamic loads on payment deflections and back calculated modulus. So here's the outline of my presentation. I'll start with a brief introduction and then talk a little bit about the finite layer method, which is what I used for payment response simulation. And then we'll talk about two different methodologies for simulating the payment response, namely the fixed point analysis and the moving frame analysis methodologies. And then we'll talk a little bit about uh, some of the vehicle models for simulating the vehicle dynamic load. And then finally, we'll talk about the effect of moving dynamic loads on um, payment response with a focus on payment deflections, as well as on back calculated modulus, which is um, another parameter we frequently derive uh, from the measured payment response. So why are we considered with vehicle dynamics? Um, because there is no pavement out there that is perfectly flat. And by that, I mean the pavement smoothness or roughness as measured by the International Roughness Index, the IRI, is always greater than zero in reality. 
And because the pavement is not perfectly flat, it causes the suspension of our vehicles to move up and down as we drive over those pavements. And of course, the rougher the pavement, the more the suspension movements, and the more uncomfortable the ride quality. And there's many, many other reasons as to why we want our pavements to be smoother or the IRI to be lower. But we will um, discuss or talk about IRI um, and other performance metrics um, during part two of the webinar. And we'll come back to talking about uh, vehicle suspensions. So why vehicle suspensions? Um, the suspension movement generates um, dynamic vehicle loads, meaning that the load is not constant. And <clears throat> the traffic speed deflection devices that are becoming uh, more and more popular nowadays, they are no exception to the vehicle suspension movement and the dynamic vehicle load. Uh, for example, here's just a plot of the uh, vehicle dynamic load um, measured from one of the um, TSDDs in Europe, and you can see it fluctuates um, quite a bit. But when we come back and do our typical analysis using the TSDD um, data, we often ignore the uh, dynamic load completely and assume that the load is equal to its static weight or static load and run our analysis. And sometimes um, when we measure the dynamic load, we know it's high or low, and we just shift uh, the load curve up and down, but still assuming a constant load. So constantly high load or constantly lower load. So the question I wanted to pose was, what are the effects of assuming such a constant load when in reality it is not? So um, ViscoWave is the program that I've used for um, simulation of all payment responses herein. Um, it's a dynamic, axisymmetric, finite layer uh, method based on impulse loading and impulse responses. And it was initially developed for dynamic back calculation of falling weight deflectometer time histories. Um, just, just a few examples here. And it was recently upgraded um, or enhanced to simulate the payment response under moving loads. Um, incorporating both of these analysis methodologies. So let's take a look at these analysis methodologies, uh, starting with the fixed point analysis. So for the fixed point analysis, the load is moving, but the deflection is calculated at a fixed point in the pavement. So if you come to this diagram on the right, the load is moving from here to here, but regardless of the location of the load, the payment response is simulated at this fixed point um, in the pavement, which we will call uh, the fixed observation point. And it's pretty intuitive, and it's similar to um, any of the, or equivalent to any of the uh, payment responses measured by the instrumentation that are that is embedded in the pavement. Of course, uh, the truck is traveling, but these instrumentation devices, they don't move with the truck. They only uh, measure the response at the locations they are installed. And this is, of course, this is intuitive, and this is what most of us um, think and use when we refer to payment response under moving loads. Now, on the other hand, for the moving frame analysis, the load is moving and the deflection is calculated at points moving with the load. Again, so if we come to this diagram, the load is moving from here to here, and the deflections or, or the payment responses are calculated at these points that move with the load. And thanks to the um, traffic speed deflection devices becoming more popular, it's pretty easy for me to explain. Just think of it as the response or the deflection measured by any of these um, uh, TSDDs. Uh, the sensors are obviously mounted uh, within the truck, not in the pavement, and those sensors are traveling uh, with the load, with the truck. And as for the analysis, uh, this analysis methodology has not been so common, um, although the theoretical idea behind this has been around for, uh, for quite a while. 
So here is the payment structure um, that I'll be using for all of the simulations herein. It's basically a three-layer uh, flexible pavement with uh, 12 inches of asphalt concrete having a frequency-dependent or time-dependent dynamic modulus over 12 inches of base over a fairly weak subgrade. So pretty much a simple uh, standard uh, flexible uh, pavement. And unless um, stated otherwise, I'll always be using the full axle uh, with 18 kip or 9 kip on each um, half of the axle uh, with dual tires. And the truck speed is fixed at 60 miles per hour for all of the simulations. Now let's take a look at what <clears throat> the payment response or the deflection may look like um, under the fixed point analysis and consider the obvious case of a constant load, uh, meaning there is no dynamic load and assuming that the IRI was literally zero. So here at location zero feet is where the uh, uh, fixed point of observation is located and the load is moving from left to right. And of course that load magnitude is basically a flat line because it's a constant load. And of course, this is intuitive. Um, the deflection or the payment response will increase as the load approaches the fixed point and will decrease as the load moves away from uh, the fixed, fixed observation point. Now, when we consider the same constant load under the moving frame analysis, and let's just consider uh, one moving observation point directly below the load. And if we calculate the deflection, plot it, it is also constant. And this is pretty much um, expected uh, because um, in, in, in the model, in the payment model, uh, the payment is assumed to be homogeneous, uniform, everywhere, nothing is changing, and, there, and the load is not changing either. And so um, when we are calculating the deflection uh, directly below the, below the load, regardless of its location, it is constant, it doesn't change. So let's see what happens when we plot these two um, together. So again, here is the uh, uh, deflection from the fixed point analysis and this flat line is from the moving frame analysis. But when we zoom in to this area there, these two curves actually um, intersect with each other at, at location zero. And that's because regardless of the analysis methodology, um, the load is at zero and the moving, uh, the, the observation points from the two analysis methodologies are also at location zero, meaning that the axial location and the observation points overlap. And of course, we should get identical deflections regardless of the analysis methodology. Now let's consider a simple dynamic load um, instead of a constant. So this is basically a, a sine curve um, that I used for simulating the dynamic load with its peak um, located on top of the fixed observation point. And let's consider um, a few more observation points um, rather than just one. So um, in the next, um, uh, uh, slide, I'll show you the results from seven uh, moving observation points. And this is what it looks like. Again, the black solid curve um, shows you the payment deflection from the fixed point um, analysis. And all of these sine curves are the deflections derived from the moving frame analysis for different uh, moving observation points. But when we take the uh, one at the bottom, um, and look at it more closely. Um, and let's say the axle location was at minus five feet. So it's five feet behind the fixed observation point. But this bottom line, uh, bottom curve actually corresponds to the moving observation point that is located five feet in front of the axle. So the move observation point actually was right on top of the fixed observation point for that one. So again, the exit location is the same, and the observation points overlap, and we are getting identical results from 
the two analysis methodologies. So what else can we do with these, um, with the um, deflections coming out of the uh, moving frame analysis methodology? Um, instead of plotting all these sine curves, say if I pick any uh, longitudinal location of the axle, like that, and grab all these deflections, deflection magnitudes, and plot them with respect to the sensor distance or sensor offset, then I will be able to get what uh, we call the instantaneous deflection basin. So these are the uh, deflection basins um, calculated at every five feet uh, from uh, this uh, moving frame analysis result. Um, and you can see it varies quite a bit compared to uh, uh, the deflection basin obtained uh, under a constant load, which is the black solid uh, line here uh, right in the middle. Okay, we will come back to the um, uh, moving frame analysis results in a little bit, but uh, uh, we will, before we go there, we will talk about some of the vehicle models for simulating the dynamic load. And when I first started looking into uh, some of these vehicle models, I realized that there's so many different models um, that are available out there, um, published in literature, from the most simple uh, models that you can imagine to uh, very, very complicated um, mm -hmm. uh, vehicle models with linear or nonlinear suspension characteristics with or without um, horizontal friction effects for uh, turning movement simulation and all that. But um, we're not here to uh, develop a driving simulator or any realistic uh, video games. So we'll, we'll stick to some, some simple um, models. And of course, the most simplest model is what is known as the quarter truck model. And I was able to find two different quarter truck models in the literature, one from uh, one, by, one developed by Dr. David Sivan um, uh, from UK, and another one uh, by Dr. Todd at Penn State University. Um, in, but, and these have different parameters, but when you actually draw the diagram, they look, all, they look like very similar to uh, what is known as the golden car, um, which is what we use for calculating the um, in, international uh, roughness index. But compared to the golden car, when everything is normalized by the, by the sprung mass, uh, these both of these quarter truck models have um, stiffer suspension and weaker tire compared to the golden car. What goes into the uh, vehicle model is the uh, pavement surface elevation um, or what we call the pavement profile. And I have borrowed um, a couple of uh, pavement profiles from the LTPP database. Uh, more specifically, uh, the smooth profile shown here on, on the top is coming from the LTPP section 04-0261 um, in Arizona. And it was a, it, the profile data was collected um, soon, after the, soon after the pavement was constructed in 1994. So you can see that the pavement is fairly smooth uh, with an IRI of about uh, 39 and 52 inches per mile. Now, for the rough profile shown here, it's coming. These profiles are coming from the same pavement section, um, but after 21 years um, of the pavement being in service, so in 2015, and you can already see that the pavement um, um, has been beat up, and there's some uh, features that will cause pavement roughness, um, as seen by the, all these. And we'll see some demonstrations. So here is how uh, how the two quarter uh, truck models would respond to the uh, uh, payment payment profile shown here. So the a vertical line shows you where the quarter truck is located. This is the diagram for Dr. Sivan's model. This is for Dr. Todd's model. Here are the plots of the dynamic load, and you can see the instantaneous deflection basin uh, moving up and down uh, due to the uh, suspension motion. 
Now, another model that I'm going to cons uh, that I'm going to consider is what is known as the walking beam model, and it basically simulates the dynamic load under a full axle. So, this entire vehicle model is in contact with the pavement um, on the left and the right wheel pad. And this model was developed uh, by Dr. Um, David Zivon, I believe, in the late 1990s, maybe early 1990s. And of course, uh, this model is traveling into the screen. So let's see how this model behaves under that uh, rough LTPP payment profile. Again, here's the payment profile with the vertical line showing you where the where the axle is located. Uh, this diagram shows you how uh, the, 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 the walking beam model uh, behaves or reacts um, to that, to the payment profile, just the plot of the dynamic load. And you can see <clears throat> that the instantaneous basins fluctuate quite significantly. Well, to summarize the walking beam model, <clears throat> this plot basically shows you the range of the instantaneous uh, deflection basin compared to the uh, deflection basin obtained under the constant load. And while the range may not be too significant under the smooth payment profile, it is dramatically uh, wide for the rough payment profile. And um, according to Dr. David Sivan, who developed this vehicle model, um, he is saying that this walking beam model represents the minority of suspensions that generate large dynamic wheel loads due to unsprung mass motion, based, i.e. Uh, pitching of the walking beam. So he is basically saying this model was developed to represent the worst of the worst um, suspensions that were around in the late 1990s, early, late 1980s, early 1990s. So it's, this model is probably not representative of the vehicle suspensions um, that are out there today. But again, this model generates some significant amount of dynamic load, and this is what we will uh, use for demonstrating the effect of dynamic loads on payment deflections and back calculated modules. But before we go there, <clears throat> I just wanted to show you another um, uh, vehicle model uh, just as a sneak peek at the uh, next webinar Wednesdays. It is a three-dimensional uh, truck uh, trailer model with uh, 14 degrees of freedom. And you may think this is, uh, this looks quite complicated, but, but if you, um, study um, enough, it, it, it's not uh, too complicated because it does not include any of the nonlinear suspension characteristics that will make this really, really complicated. So um, all in all, uh, this model is nothing but just a bunch of masses uh, here and there connected by a bunch of springs and linear dash pods. Now, in the previous examples, we only showed up to um, seven moving observation points, but with this uh, three-dimensional uh, truck trailer model, I decided to go a little more extreme. So I put, uh, located the uh, moving observation points on each wheel path um, spaced at every 0.1 feet. Uh, so we had a total of about uh, 1,200 moving observation points in each wheel path um, for a total of two, about 2,400 moving observation points. And the reason I did that was to try to get a full picture um, of the deflection under the full length of the truck. And so far, we really focused on payment deflections, but I want to, want to point out that the moving frame analysis um, can be um, extended to any payment responses, um, stresses or strains. So just as a demonstration, the next animation will show you the deflection of the, um, of the pavement under the uh, 3D uh, truck, as well as the longitudinal stress and strain that was calculated at the bottom of the asphalt concrete layer. So this animation is really busy, but again, here is the rough 
LTPP payment profile. This is a rear view of the trailer. And here's the left half and the right half of the truck. And as the truck is traveling over this uh, rough payment profile, this is how uh, the deflection would fluctuate. And these are basically zoomed in versions of the deflection under each of these axles. And the second row um, shows you the longitudinal stress calculated at the bottom of the asphalt concrete layer. And the bottom row of uh, figures um, show you the longitudinal strains. So uh, just to prove a point that the moving frame analysis methodology can be used for any um, pavement responses. But why should we stop there? So I just wanted to um, go a little more extreme and uh, basically took the one, one half of the trailer axle and instead of a dual, I assumed it to be a single tire just to make it simple. And I've had placed the uh, moving observation points not only in the longitudinal direction, but also in the transverse direction um, um, uh, ranging from going from minus 30 feet to 30 feet uh, at every 0.1 feet. So uh, the bottom line is I put about 90,600 moving observation points uh, because I wanted to be able to visualize it in 3, 3D, just like what I'm showing you here. So here um, is the uh, 3D visualization of the payment deflection under uh, the dynamic load. Uh, the only difference between the one on the left and the one on the right is that there is a tire here on the left just to um, represent the dynamic load or the suspension movement. Uh, the 2D plot on the left basically shows you the dynamic load trace and this little red dot shows you where the axle is at that point in time. And the two-dimensional plot on the right um, is just a, um, a, a plot of the payment deflection along the longitudinal center line um, of the tire. So finally, we can we are uh, to a point where we can talk about the effect of moving dynamic loads on payment deflections and back calculated modulus. So. I'm going to revisit the question um, that I had posted earlier. Uh, so we have seen that the vehicle uh, models or the vehicles generate um, some serious dynamic loads and we can uh, calculate the deflections using the moving frame analysis methodology, convert that to a instantaneous deflection basin. Now, we can do the same by assuming a constant load. So for any load that we see here, we can uh, take that magnitude, assume a constant, assume that the load is constant throughout the length of the payment section, get the pavement deflections, and plot the uh, uh, deflection basin um, accordingly, and we can compare these two deflections. The question is, are they going to be the same? Um, and if they are different, um, can we match the deflection by back calculating the payment properties, meaning changing other payment properties such as modulus uh, to match them? And if we do that, what are the effects? What errors are we going to see? So <clears throat> uh, let's first talk about the effective uh, constant load assumption on the uh, deflection basin itself. So uh, here uh, on the top graph shows you the root mean square error uh, coming from the constant load assumption in terms of mills, and the bottom plot shows you the root mean square error in terms of percent. And the blue dots are the errors obtained for the smooth payment profile, um, and the uh, red dots are the errors obtained from the rough payment profile. And you can immediately see that the smooth for the smooth payment profile, the error is not too significant. Uh, they are mostly within half a mil um, or, or 10%. But, as, but for the rough payment, the error could be quite significant. It can go up uh, above two mils. 
which translates to about 60% of the error. Now, just to demonstrate what back calculation means for, for this context, I've uh, picked out a uh, uh, instantaneous deflection basin at station 247, which corresponds to a very low instantaneous load. So here the blue curve shows you the uh, uh, instantaneous deflection basin from, uh, from, the dynamic, uh, from the dynamic load. And the red curve shows you the uh, deflection basin assuming a constant load of 2,600 uh, pounds. And you can see that there is some significant difference. The RMSC um, calculated between these two uh, was close to 52%. So in order to match this um, response to that, uh, we can run that calculation. Uh, we can change the payment modulus. Of course, they are not correct modulus, but, what, but when we do, we can reduce the RMSE down to 5.7%, but then now we have a different payment modulus. So are those modulus values correct? The answer is no. So here are the errors that I've obtained uh, from back calculating <clears throat> the in instantaneous uh, deflection basins uh, with the constant load assumption. And you can see that for the smooth payment profile, again, the error is mostly within 10%, plus minus 10%. But on a rough payment profile, uh, the back calculated modulus could show you an error um, that is as high as 60%. Um, and regardless of the smoothness, uh, smooth or rough, uh, the subgrade modulus seems to be affected um, the most, uh, followed by the asphalt modulus and, and the base modulus. So in summary, um, we looked at two different analysis methodologies for simulating the payment response. Um, again, the fixed point analysis, just like its name um, uh, is representing, the, the response is calculated at a fixed point. And think of any uh, instrument, instrumentation that is embedded um, within, within the pavement. These instrumentation devices do not travel uh, with the vehicle always calculating the response at their respective locations. But moving frame analysis methodology, uh, they are calculating the, uh, the response is calculated uh, on, the, on the observation points that travel with the load. Um, and just try to visualize the deflections that are measured by, the, by any of the traffic speed deflection devices. <clears throat> And we looked at uh, uh, the effect of uh, vehicle dynamic loads, um, and I've sh I showed you uh, a few different models, but uh, models are models. Um, they may or may not uh, represent uh, the uh, vehicle suspensions that are out there today, but um, some of the simple vehicle models um, may at least give us a rough idea of the dynamic load if they are not uh, measured. But if you're in the um, area of traffic speed deflection devices doing some analysis, it's probably ideal or best if we can measure um, the dynamic load along with the uh, deflection. So the bottom line is the vehicle dynamic loads would affect the dynamic or instantaneous deflection basins, as we saw uh, in a number of examples. Um, here in this, here in today's webinar, oops. And the vehicle dynamic loads also affect the back calculated modulus if you are assuming a constant uh, load for the TSDEs. And I'm not saying that you have to incorporate the dynamic load whenever you are doing the back calculation. All I'm trying to uh, bring up is that depending on the models and depending on the uh, limitations of the models you have, there will be errors in the analysis you do, and you just need to be, or we just need to be aware um, um, of those errors. And that's all I had for today. So thank you, and um, Jerry, uh, 
Okay. Yes, thank, back th you. thank you, Young. Thank you. Um, that was a fantastic delivery. I uh, I must admit, uh, not that I'm surprised at all, on a very complex topic. So um, if you have questions, and we do have a number of questions that have already been typed in, but we'll get to those in a few minutes. Uh, we want to remind you of a couple of things before we get into the Q&A program. First of all is that part two, as we've uh, mentioned already uh, several times that this program will be delivered by Young again uh, on August the 19th, of course, that is a Wednesday. And uh, you see that here. Uh, I'll also be talking in a, in a moment about our programs that are recorded. And uh, we look at this particular part two topic, it's, it's really focused on a slightly different emphasis area, mechanistic empirical prediction of uh, the IRI, International Roughness Index. Next slide, please. We uh, generally have liked to have a, a diverse range of not only topics, but from uh, different presenters, both strong practitioners, strong researchers, just as you heard Young and I introduced him. He uh, comes from our research side of the house, but also has a lot of practicality. So on this slide, uh, you see the upcoming webinars. We have now programs uh, booked um, through December of this year, and this will be an ongoing program. We've had a great response from our engineers and our scientists, and this is all uh, focused on surface transportation topics and it's all presented by ARA employees. So just quickly eyeball of the four topics that are listed here. Young, as they introduced them, is from our Champaign, Illinois office, uh, the September program on probabilistic safety analysis and friction management. Amount is from our Champaign office as well. Our October program is from our Toronto office. Shiloh will be presenting that, and that is on uh, super heavy load movements and had a pre a preview of that, and that should be a very interesting program. And then finally, for our November program, I mentioned we'll book through December, we have Mr. Brian Ajo, who uh, specializes in airport pavement management. And will give us a little view of past, present, and future. And Brian is from our Madison, Wisconsin office. If you want to register for any of these programs, you see the um, www address where you can find out more about the programs and register for any of those as you would like. Next slide, please. So I'd like to spend a little bit of time on uh, the questions that we have, and uh, we've got a time, I, I believe, to address most of the questions as we go forward here. So forgive me as I, I read these, Young, and, um, and I'll paraphrase as best I can. So the first question is from, and then and the question is, do you think that dynamic load effects on deflection and stress should influence the vertical curve geometric design? I've got to scroll down myself here, which currently is only designed for site distance and does not include any consideration of dynamic loading. That's a tough question. Um, and let me uh, go back to one of the uh, slides. Um, if you look at this uh, sample uh, dynamic load uh, that was measured by one of the TSDDs, it's not fluctuating like the uh, like the uh, example that I showed you from the model. It's at, say, for example, this blue curve it stays up here for quite a while, and that's because the truck was going uh, 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 basically over a uh, over a curve, and so you can see that it, the the dynamic load is higher uh, on one of the wheel paths, but lower on the other wheel paths when when the truck is turning over the um, over the curve. So um, it's probably reasonable um, to incorporate incorporate that into design if if we know how much that additional load we're going to get, but it's probably not easy to quantify um, and implement that into into a design. That's my understanding. Okay, thank you. Um, so we have an, uh, several other questions to try and deal with them as we go along here. So I'm going to bypass the kudos that you received. We're getting some comments in that regard. Again, excellent delivery. 
So the question is from Paul, and it seems that a rough road, the question, excuse me, it mm-hmm. seems that a rough road will increase vehicle load dynamics, mm-hmm. i.e. the magnification of the vehicle dynamic loads and increased potential pavement damage. Is that a correct observation? Uh, that's actually what we're going to be talking extensively during uh, part two of the webinar. But if you ask me, I believe the um, uh, rough pavement or the dynamic load generated under the rough pavement would accelerate uh, the pavement damage. Yes. Okay. Um, next question. Um, and then uh, I'm speaking in your behalf, Young, but in the past, if, if folks have follow-up questions, uh, you could see on our slide here uh, Young's email address. I'm sure he'd be receptive to entertain uh, because this is a fairly complex topic and it's, it's difficult to provide abbreviated questions and answers in, uh, in a written format sometimes. Sure. And Bella uh, asked a question. And uh, if there's a, any standard that you follow when conducting such research, and if your answer is yes, I'm interested in what are the allowed standard deviations for easy interpretation of errors? And lastly, I'd like to know if from this research can you draw any correlations to pavement performance or do I still need to conduct FWD testing to determine pavement performance, excuse me. That's a long list of questions. Of that. <laughs> yeah, that was, there's really two questions there. I'd be happy to repeat it, but uh, are you uh, okay to answer go, Going back to the first question, I believe it was on uh, on some kind of a standard um, on on conducting this type of research. Uh, no, I'm not it, aware of any standard. What, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it began with a standard, but it really was in, it was asking relative to what are the allowed standard deviations for easy interpretation oh. of errors. What are the allowed standard deviations? Um, Correct. I think there yeah, that, is a, difficult. yeah, that's a difficult question. Um, but I don't think there's a lot of uh, folks that looked into this topic. Um, and I don't think there is a general agreement on the allowable uh, standard deviation for the errors. But I would say for all practical purposes, um, and I'm just, uh, uh, this is just my personal opinion, not based on any standards or regulations. I would say if the error is within plus minus 10%, uh, that's probably acceptable for uh, the practical um, things that we're doing in engineering. Yeah, I, I, so another way to answer this, if I can help you, uh, and I do a fair amount of statistical, is we, we look at conventional statistical evaluations examination of outliers, regression analysis models, of which there are a multitude. Mm-hmm. But um, I could do that presentation another time. Anyway, um, <laughs> and the second question, uh, same individual, like to know, from, based on this research, can any uh, correlations be drawn such to pay, uh, related to pavement performance such that a FWD test is not no longer required, I and mean, that might be a potential futuristic goal of it. Um, correlation to field performance. Um, I haven't showed you the uh, the data from this LT, actual LTPP payment section, but when you run this rough payment profile through the vehicle model, let's say the walking beam model, um, and you see the areas where uh, the dynamic, high dynamic loads are generated. And I try to go back to the distress maps uh, to, um, you know, coming from this section. And indeed, um, there are some severe distresses in these areas where the dynamic loads were higher. but. This is just one section, and that's why I didn't try to come to any conclusions. I mean, I, we would have to look at many, many, many uh, payment profiles and their performance over time to draw that conclusion. Um, <clears throat> but um, for the FWD testing, that's 
that's another tough question because uh, it's not a continuous um, test. It's a stationary test that you do at these discrete locations. And if the payment is perfectly uniform, you probably won't see this effect. I mean, if it's just a payment profile that is changing, you probably won't be able to detect this from the FWD. Uh, if you want to detect the uh, payment variability, uh, say thickness or strength or the modulus, then yes. Um, and that's another thing we will be talking about during part two of the webinar, um, um, uh, payment variabilities other than profile uh, itself uh, during part two. So. So these are all good commercials for part two. Uh, very, very sneaky. Very good. Uh, <laughs> so we have we have uh, other questions and move along crisply here, and we uh, we're fortunate that we have uh, sufficient time. So um, the question is related to if uh, moving speed of the vehicle is a factor that's considered in this research. No, I have only considered uh, one uh, speed, sixty miles an hour. Um, and so I really can't say if speed is going to affect it. If so, how much? No, that's another thing that is on my plate uh, for future um, simulations and research or studies. But as of as of today, no, I've only considered one one speed. Okay, thank you. Um, next question is, um, you've explained how you can simulate the deflection basin resulting from the dynamic load through ma manipulation of the layer modulus. Do you think that the pseudo-modulus, excuse me, do you think that the pseudo-modulus, um, getting a lot of pop-ups or questions, do you think that the pseudo-modulus can be used to compare the dynamic damage through calculating running and cracking using the pseudo MR? That's a tough question, too. <laughs> it is. Sending you uh, easy questions. <laughs> and yeah, I know cracking and rutting was mentioned. And again, that's something we will talk more about during part two. It's all of, uh, part two is going to be all about performance. So I'll be talking heavily about rutting um, and IRI and a little bit of cracking. But um, um, coming back to the question, I think the question was about um, using the constant load, doing the back calculation, and, and using it for design. Could you repeat that portion, Jerry? Sure. Yeah, I, I can certainly do that. So the latter part, the real question was, do you think that the pseudo-modulus can be used to compare the dynamic damage through calculating running and cracking using the pseudo MR. Yeah, I'm not sure what uh, pseudo MR is, but I will assume that is the back calculated um, modulus under the constant load assumption having all these um, errors. And like I said, um, uh, if if the constant load assumption is all you have, and if the most, if if you don't have any other model to compare to, that's the only number you're going to have, and you probably won't have a way to assess the error that you're going to get. You just have to live with that number. Um, so, if you're doing design, you know, my, again going back to my conclusion, you just have to be aware that there are errors, and the error may be bigger for rougher pavements, which is typically the case um, when the pavement is approaching its uh, end of life. So. Okay. Um, another question, and we have an acronym here. Uh, so did you confirm the results of your analysis with field data, such as those measured from capitals, TSDDs? I know material properties would be an issue. Uh, as of yet, no, I ha I don't have any uh, field measurements to compare against um, because uh, obviously everything I showed you here today is uh, coming out of the vehicle simulation and the pavement response simulation. Everything is uh, everything was 
uh, generated on a computer. There is nothing measured. Um, the only thing, the closest thing that uh, that is the closest thing to what is measured is probably the payment profile itself. That's the only thing measured. Um, but no, I don't have any performance that I compare any of these results um, um, with reality. That's something I would like to get to, um, definitely. It'll be my dream come true, if you ask me. Our research is never done. Uh, this is my 48th year of practice, and we're studying the same things and the different thing that I did in year one. So we have a few more questions, and we've got about six minutes or so remaining for a question period here. Uh, and, and the next couple are a couple of softball questions, I think, easier to articulate and perhaps for you to also answer. So, uh, Alana had asked the question of what is a finite layer method, and he's familiar with finite difference and FEM methods, uh, but never heard previously of a finite layer method. Oh, I actually have a um, hidden slide. Uh, for that purpose. So finite layer method is um, similar to the finite element method, which I believe most of you um, have heard before. Um, it's similar to the finite element in the sense that the entire payment structure is broken down into smaller elements. But in the finite element method, you have to break down each of these layer into many, 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 many smaller um, elements, but in the finite layer method, um, the solution for each layer is derived um, analytically or at least semi-analytically. So uh, uh, one layer essentially becomes one element, and these different elements or different layers are connected uh, the same way that these finite elements are connected. So if we have a three-layer payment structure, that means we only have three elements finite layer method, and uh, having less number of uh, elements or layers that just uh, helps us to get the results uh, more efficiently, uh, more faster, compared to um, the full-blown 3D finite element. Okay. Um, again, uh, a fairly succinct question. Um, can you conduct the moving frame analysis with other existing programs that simulate payment response? Uh, yes, it can be done. Um, it's just, uh, uh, depending on what program or what um, um, analytical solution you have. Uh, for example, if it's just a layered elastic model with uh, linear elastic material models, the models don't depend on, uh, the models are not time dependent, so you're already done. You just run the uh, layered, anal uh, layered analysis uh, once uh, with uh, a bunch of um, observation points, and then from then, that point on, all you can change is the load magnitude. So the deflection will be um, um, scaled up or scaled down depending on the, on the load. If you have a layered viscoelastic model, uh, which I know is becoming fairly popular uh, nowadays, or if you have a dynamic uh, model uh, like the one I have, it's a little more involved and you probably will have to tweak the source code um, so that your output is reorganized to spit out the moving frame results. Um, but it's, it's doable. And if you are running the full-blown finite element again, then it's probably doable too because for the finite element, uh, the solution is derived uh, for the entire domain of the pavement. So you just need maybe need to write another separate code to extract the, uh, the pavement response wherever the load is, as the load is moving. Okay, we've only got about two minutes left for questions, so let, let's try and get one more in here. On uh, reference to slide 42, um, this the deflections that were shown were fluctuating under a constant load. And the question is why shouldn't shouldn't this deflection be a constant value? The, the def deflection was, oh. <clears throat> this, portion, this portion, okay. 
Um, uh, well, we all agree that it's flat um, out here. So I guess the question is um, this transient uh, behavior, or, or excuse me, let me try to use some plain language. Um, the, the payment model that I've used is a dynamic model. So there's effective inertia or mass. And the way that the analysis is run is that the pavement, uh, the load, uh, lands on the pavement and then starts uh, traveling over uh, or, uh, over the pavement. So when I start the analysis, the, the axle lands on the pavement, meaning the load goes from zero to whatever, 9,000 pounds, let's say. And because of that landing impact, uh, the pavement actually shows some vibratory or transient response um, initially but that response actually dies out um, fairly quickly. And I'm sorry, I should have chopped that portion off um, uh, just to avoid any confusion, and I have done that here, um, but I obviously failed to do that here because you know, I'm not an airfield engineer um, I'm interested in landing or taking off kind of effect. So. Okay, very good. Uh, we forgive you for that. Um, so would you take me on to slide 50, please? This will uh, just kind of wrap up the program. Sure. And uh, first of all, I want to thank everybody on behalf of Young, myself, is Jerry again, and ARA is a whole corporation. And uh, today's program is being recorded, and there's a link uh, where you can go and view all previous ARA webinars. And in particular, this is a two-part program, as we said multiple times. So if you had a colleague who did not make today's program or you're interested but you're unavailable for the August Part 2 version, you can go to this site, obviously, a little bit after August to see Part 2 or in a few days uh, and view this program. And uh, we encourage you to do that. To request a PDH certificate, or a copy of the presentation, uh, please send an email to arawebinars at ara.com. Next slide, please. We're always looking for great people, so uh, this is obviously uh, an infomercial. And uh, if you're interested in employment opportunities with ARA's transportation infrastructure sector, that's only one of our business units, please send a brief resume and your contact information the address that's shown on this particular slide. And thank you all for joining us today. Stay safe and healthy. We look forward to meeting you in person in the future. Thanks again, Young. Fantastic program. Thank you. Thank you.